Okay, so we're going to watch uh, the second part of Act 1 uh, from A Doll's House, but I want us to pay attention in the scene um, between the sort of contrasting characters of Mrs. Lind or Christine Lind and Nora. Uh, so these two characters are sort of, Nora is a bit of, uh, you know, more frivolous and free with her money. Uh, and Mrs. Lind is a very sort of hard luck woman. She's had to uh, pay her own way uh, through life and um, doesn't have the same sort of privileges that Nora has had. So these two women are sort of contrasted with one another and it's in a way it's sort of setting up a kind of foil character for Nora, um, somebody who she is, a, you know, who is her sounding board and who uh, also sort of is a contrasting character. Uh, okay, so we want to, while you're watching the clip or have you uh, read the scene, uh, make some notes on the information that we learn about Mrs. Lind. So what has she experienced in her life um, in regards to her marriage and her family and any other information that you think uh, seems pertinent or important. Um, note how she's different uh, than Nora. And then I also want us to discuss what Nora's secret is. So uh, people have a tendency to think that Nora is a little stupid or not serious, too frivolous or uh, childlike, uh, but Nora sees herself differently. So she has, she knows or feels like she has done uh, something great in life and that she has in fact save, saved her husband's life uh, by taking action herself. Um, so we'll get more information about her secret that she's keeping from her husband. Um, so we'll uh, talk about those aspects after watching uh, the clip. <laughs> now you look like your old self again. It was just when I first saw you. But you are a little bit paler, Christina. A little bit thinner, perhaps. And much, much older, Nora. Oh, well, a little bit older, perhaps, but not much at all. Oh, goodness. Oh, how thoughtless of me chattering away like this. Oh, dear, sweet Christina, can you forgive me? What do you mean? Well, poor Christina, you've lost your husband. Yes, three years ago. Yes. Believe me, Christina, I often thought of writing to you at the time. I, I don't know, I, I just kept putting it off, and then something always cropped up. Nora, I do understand. No, it was terrible of me. Awful, awful. You poor thing. What you must have been through. And it didn't leave you anything. No. And no children. Not even a sense of loss. But Christina, can that be possible? Oh, it sometimes happens, Nora. Utterly alone, how terribly sad for you. I've got three lovely children. You can't see them just now because I'm out with their nanny. But tell me everything about yourself now. Um, no, no, I want to hear about you. No, you start. I won't be selfish today. I will only think about you today. I must just tell you one thing, though. What do you think? My husband has just been made manager of the savings bank. How oh, lucky. Yes, tremendously. It was a very precarious living being a lawyer, you know, especially if you're not prepared to take on anything that isn't absolutely above board, which of course two of them would. And I quite agree with him about that. He starts at the bank on New Year's Day and he's going to be earning a big salary and lots of commission. Oh, goodness. Christina, I feel so relieved and happy because it's so lovely to have plenty of money not to have to worry, isn't it? Yes. It must be lovely to have enough at any rate. Not just enough, but masses and masses of money. Oh, Nora. <laughs> haven't you learned any sense yet? Even in school you were a spendthrift. Well, that says I still am. <laughs> yes, but Nora, Nora isn't as silly as you think. No, we haven't had the money for me to spend. We've both had to work. You as well. Oh, yes. Yes. Just little things, you know, like sewing and embroidery and uh, one or two other things as well. No, Torvald's had to take on all sorts of extra jobs. The first year of our marriage, he overdid things terribly. He worked all hours of the day and night, but he wasn't up to it and he became dangerously ill. The doctor said it was essential for him to go south. You spent a whole year in Italy, didn't you? It wasn't easy to get away, I can tell you, because I just had Ivor and we had to go, of course. And it was a lovely trip, absolutely wonderful, and it saved Torvald's life. But it cost
cost a great deal of money, Christina. Well, times like that, you're lucky to have it. We got it from Papa, you see. Oh, I see. And your husband came back cured? Yes, fit as a fiddle. But the doctor? What do you mean? I thought the maid said the man who arrived with me was the doctor. Oh, no. <laughs> no, that's Dr. Rank. No, he's not here on a professional visit. No, he's our closest friend. He looks in at least uh, once a day. Torvald hasn't had a day's illness since. And the children are fit and healthy, and so am I. <laughs> oh, goodness, Christina. Isn't it wonderful to be alive and happy? Oh, mm, oh it is beastly of me. All I'm doing is talking about myself. Oh, you mustn't be angry with me. Uh, tell me now, um, is it really true that you didn't love your husband? Why did you marry him, then? My mother was bedridden and helpless. I had my two young brothers to look after. I didn't feel it would be right to refuse his offer. No, no, you were probably right about that. Yes. So he was rich at the time, then, was he? He was quite well off, I thought. But his business wasn't doing well. When he died, it all went to pieces. There was nothing left. So, so then... Then I ran a little shop for a while. Oh. Had a little school. <laughs> Anything I could think of. These last three years, I've never stopped working. But now it's over, Nora. My poor mother doesn't need me anymore. She's dead. Nor do my brothers. They've got jobs and can look after themselves. Oh, you must feel greatly relieved. No. Just unutterably empty. If only I could have the luck to find a job. Some kind of office work. Oh, so Christine. It's so terribly tiring, and you look tired out as it is. Now, the best thing for you will be a little holiday. Go to a spa somewhere. I don't have a papa to pay for it, Nora. Oh, look, you mustn't be angry with oh, me. Oh, I'm I... sorry. Don't you be angry with me. The worst thing about being in a situation like mine is it makes you bitter. Well, you've no one to live for, so you get to be selfish. Can you believe it? When you told me about your good fortune, I wasn't happy nearly so much for your sake as I was for my own. What do you mean? Oh, I see. Oh, you think the Dorval might be able to do something for you? Yes, that's oh. what I was thinking. Well, I'll see that he does. Leave it to me. I'll bring it up very, very delicately. I'll put him in a really good mood. <laughs> oh, Christina, I'd so like to help you. It's lovely of you, Nora, to want to help. It's especially lovely of you when you've known so little of life's troubles or hardships. You really oughtn't to say that in such a superior way. I, 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 I'm just like all the others. You all think, you all think I am incapable of anything really serious. Oh, no, no, I, I have to struggle in this difficult world. You rather look down on me, Christina, don't you? But you shouldn't, you know. I've got something to be pleased and proud about, too. I haven't told you about my really big thing. What do you mean? Shh. Look, Torvald mustn't overhear us, not at any price. No one must find out about it, Christina. Nobody but you. Besides, 
draws out in his masculine pride. You know, it would be very embarrassing for him, humiliating, really, to know that he owed anything to me. No, it would damage our relationship. This lovely, happy home of ours would never be the same again. Will you never tell him? Someday, perhaps. Many years from now, when he's not as taken with me as he is at the moment, when he no longer gets any pleasure out of watching me dance for him and dress up and recite. Might be useful then to have something up my sleeve. No, that time will never come. Well, Christina, what have you got to say to my big secret? Aren't I capable of something? Well, anyway, the whole business has been a great deal of worry to me, I can tell you. It hasn't been at all easy for me to meet my obligations on time. In the business world, you see, there are these things called instalments, and there's something else called quarterly interest, and they're sometimes very hard to come by. I've had to save a little bit here, a little bit there, wherever I could, you see. I couldn't take too much out of the housekeeping, because Torvald had to live well, and I can't have the children looking shabby, little sweethearts. But whenever Torvald gave me money for dresses and things, I only ever spent half. Luckily, even cheap things suit me pretty well, so Torvald never noticed I found some other ways of earning money as well. Last winter, I was lucky enough to get a lot of copying to do, and so I shut myself away every night, and I sat writing till late into the night. I used to get so tired, so tired. But at the same time, it was tremendous fun sitting there, writing and earning money. It was always like being a man. How much have you managed to pay? Well, I can't tell exactly. See, it's very difficult to keep track of with a business like this. All I do know is that I've paid off every penny I've been able to scrape together. Sometimes I've known where to turn. Then I used to imagine that this rich gentleman had fallen in love with me. What? Gentleman? No, no, wait. And that now he died. And when they opened his will, it said in enormous letters, All my money is to go to the charming Mrs. Nora Helmer. Immediately, in cash. Nora, who's this man? There wasn't any old gentleman. Good heavens, don't you understand? He was just somebody I used to dream about over and over again when I couldn't find any way of paying back the money. Oh, but it doesn't matter now. The boring old thing, I'd keep out of it now. I'm finished with him and his will because I haven't got a care in the world. Oh, Christina, what a lovely thought. <laughs> just as Torvald likes it, and the spring will be here soon. Oh, that stretch of blue air everywhere. Maybe I shall see the sea again. Oh, yes, it is wonderful to be alive and happy. Isn't... Perhaps I'd better go. Oh, no, do stay. I don't suppose it's for me. It's probably someone for Torvald. Okay, so let's uh, do a little bit of a contrast uh, and compare the different characteristics of Nora and Christine. Uh, so these two female characters are meant to sort of con contrast with one another. Um, so on the surface their appearance and their life experience uh, both sort of suggest that these are uh, contrary uh, characters. So on the surface Nora is very beautiful and youthful while Christine, Mrs. Lind, is a lot older looking or that's what they describe her as. Um, so she she looks like she has gone through a lot. She's experienced a lot in life, and this has aged her. And Nora has had a rather easier life in comparison. So Nora, we know, is in you know a stable uh, marriage, um, and she has three children. And she talks about you know how happy she is, and she's looking forward to life, and they're really. Um, her, her husband is getting promoted to bank manager, uh, so there's a lot to look forward to. So she's very almost giddy in her happiness. Whereas Mrs. Lind com comes across as very sort of serious, uh, sad. Um, we know that she is a widow, but she didn't really love her husband, and she sort of married out of necessity, necessity to take care of her ailing mother and her two younger brothers. Um, so it wasn't a marriage for love, it was a marriage sort of of necessity um, based on economics. 
and uh, her husband died leaving her with nothing so she has had to struggle as a widow to support herself financially and this has been a hard struggle making ends meet uh, taking odd jobs and working for a living unlike Nora who has uh, not had to work uh, in her life very I guess seriously and she's able to Nora just you know relies on her husband as the breadwinner and they have sort of parallel circumstances where uh, Nora's father was very sick on his deathbed and Christine's mother was very sick on his deathbed but Nora goes uh, and stays with her husband um, and then whereas Christine stays with her mother and uh, younger brothers to take care of them so a bit of a con uh, contrast there and then Ni Nora comes off as very sort of childlike and naive in her approach to life her worldview seems very naive whereas Christine comes across as very almost bitter uh, in the hand that she's been dealt and she's somewhat um, critical of Nora's kind of carefree attitude and criticize the way that Nora spends so freely and just you know takes for granted a lot of the privilege and wealth that she has in her life uh, because not everybody has that kind of privilege obviously um, and then Nora, Nora is angry at some points in their conversation just because she feels like she's never been taken seriously and uh, this is a point that she has to make clear so she wants to prove to Christine that she has some experience in life that she is capable of doing something serious and meaningful she's not just a feather-brained uh, housewife or whatever she has um, a real value and purpose in her life other than just being spending money and having fun uh, so this is where she she uh, tells Christine her the true story of what happened so the secret is revealed so Nora reveals her secret to Christine that when Helmer was sick uh, she was told by the doctor that he needed to take a year to relax and recuperate so they planned uh, for an Italian vacation uh, which was very expensive and everyone in, including Helmer believes that Nora's father gave them the money to go on this retreat but little do everybody know that it was actually Nora who raised the money herself to fund this trip that restored Helmer's health and saved his life so she is able to say that uh, she has saved uh, she says, I was the one who saved Torvald's life. So she credits herself with this very, um, you know, very sort of profound, life changing action of raising the money to take her husband uh, to Italy where he was able to recuperate. So Nora explains to Christine the situation, and uh, this is what Nora says. So I'll just read you the passage. Uh, where she talks about the situation. Um, so Nora has taken out a loan in order to uh, raise the money for her husband to uh, go on this uh, relaxing trip. So um, she says, but the whole point was that he mustn't know anything. Good heavens, can't you see? He wasn't even supposed to know how desperately ill he was. It was me the doctors came and told his life was in danger. That the only way to save him was to go south for a while. Do you think I didn't try to talk him into it first? I began dropping hints about how nice it would be if I could be taken on a little trip abroad like other young wives. I wept, I pleaded, I told him he ought to show some consideration for my condition and let me have a bit of my own way. And then I suggested he might take out a loan, but at that he nearly lost his temper, Christine. He said I was being frivolous, that it was his duty as a husband not to give in to all these whims and fancies of mine. As I do believe he called them. All right, I thought, somehow you've got to be saved, and it was then I found a way. So 
So she basically tells everybody that her father gave her the money or gave them the money to go on this Italian retreat when really she borrowed money without telling her husband and uh, that's how they afforded this trip. So one of the interesting uh, things that the play uh, mentions, and it has to do with the kind of historical context, uh, is the fact that a woman like Nora uh, wouldn't have had the ability to get a loan on her own. She had to have had a kind of male guardian, an authority in her life, to guarantee the loan. Uh, so women were thought to be irresponsible, irrational, uh, not sensible enough to handle a kind of loan agreement and uh, they had to have the male authority of their husband or their father uh, also sort of co-sign the loan to guarantee that it would be paid back. Uh, so this does situate the play in a kind of specific time period when women weren't, um, didn't have the same access to uh, rights that uh, men had in society, including their, you know, financial uh, control of their own wealth. Um, and then in terms of, uh, in Norway, the specific location uh, where Ibsen was writing about, it wasn't until, or so in 1850, women's status was considered as incapable, uh, that it was impossible to enter into any agreements, debts, or even control their own money. So women were incapable of controlling their own lives and they had to uh, they were under the sort of uh, authority of either their father or their husband so uh, it was you know when Mrs. Lynn says a wife can't borrow without her husband's consent that's what they're talking about the fact that uh, a woman like Nora would have no power to gain money uh, through a loan without her husband's permission or her father's permission. So this is what makes her getting a loan behind her husband's back even more kind of insidious or challenging or disturbing um, because it was against the law for a woman to enter into any financial agreement if her husband didn't know about it. Um, and this will become a sort of key plot conflict uh, as this play goes on in relation to how Nora got that money without her husband knowing and then when her father was on his deathbed. So that becomes one of the central key complications uh, in this play.